Welcome to Real Estate Investing for Women. On this show, you will learn how to create wealth through real estate the blissful way. That means with very little stress and very little time. We talk about strategies, mindset, heart set, money smarts, resources, and so much more to ensure you're able to create the success you most deeply desire. Now, here's your host, Monika Sawyer. Today, I am so excited to welcome to the show, Nancy Wynn. Nancy is a physician, an eye surgeon, and impact real estate investor. I love that term. Um, she started investing in real estate to create passive income, hoping to regain control of her time and stop trading time for money. She founded Clear Vision Investing to not only grow her own portfolio, but also to help others realize the power of real estate. She is passionate about helping others, especially physicians, gain financial literacy and achieve financial security through real estate investing. She believes that financially intelligent physicians can change medicine and the world for the better. As an impact investor, Nancy believes that real estate investing can deliver attractive financial returns while also making a positive social impact. I believe that too. Part of the profits from her company is donated to giving the gift of sight to someone in need and a cure and to cure preventable blindness globally. Nancy, that just sent shivers down my spine and all over. Just what a beautiful bio and a beautiful mission. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here with you today. Yeah. You know, it's so funny, Nancy. We think of doctors as like rich and smart and many people think of them as pompous, right? <laughs> right? Like they, they think they know everything, right? My mom's a physician, just so you know. So I kind of know the way the world perceives and um, we need our doctors and it's, you know, there's all these opinions. And what's so interesting is we never think of as a physician as needing financial literacy. And I know from personal experience, because my mom is a physician, so we hung out with a lot of them that they make a lot of money. They also have this huge um, social expectation to live up to and so they spend so much of that time, first of all, serving their patients, but then also feeling because they're of service, they come to the world of service, right? That's what physicians do. They also feel that they have to kind of live up to the expectations of how people see them, right? And so they put so much more importance outwardly and they they don't have the financial of um, literacy to create a life that then can be bigger than themselves, right? Um, so it's, uh, I think it's so awesome. We've had one other doctor that's doing a very similar thing um, on the show. And I just love what you're doing for these people that serve us, serve their communities. Um, they go through this huge education, they go through their residencies, they sacrifice so much to be able to be of service. And, um, and then their lives get so tied up that they can't, they never get to retire, right? Or they never get to mm -hmm. get the freedom of time with their children and their families and the things that are important to them. So just really good job. And then to expand it to something even bigger than that, right? To be even a bigger service to community in different ways. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, for that perspective. And I think you hit it right on point is that physicians were so used to sacrifice, sacrificing our twenties and often our early thirties, or even later sometime years and years, um, to get into this profession, become that attending physician. But through that process, right. We also financially accumulate a lot of debt. A lot mm -hmm. of us graduate with over six figures of student loans from college and med school. And then when you're in residency, you're earning less than minimum wage for the amount of hours that you work. So you start off with this negative net worth. And then all of a sudden, as you said, society kind of expects you to live up to this expectation of this doctor image, the big mm -hmm. house, the cars, the private schools. And then you, people often get up caught in the cycle of where they're, they're, they're working and they're making good money, but they're kind of chasing a hamster wheel. And they mm -hmm. never, as you said, experience that freedom, financial freedom, but also that time freedom. And then eventually that geographic freedom and mm -hmm. freedom of relationships and freedom of purpose to do what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's so sad, right? Because they, they, um, 
And this is true in many professions, not just with physicians. I've seen it with vets. I've seen it with dentists. I've seen it in all different professions, whether it's healthcare or not, um, where people sacrifice so much and end up at a place where they don't get that the freedoms that will make their life blissful. So yeah, it's really amazing. Tell us a little bit about your journey. Like how did you get to from being physician to real estate investor? Just like the two two minute high level. How did you get here? <laughs> yeah, so so briefly, um, I'm um, a child of refugees. So my parents came here after the Vietnam War um, in 1980. So I was the first in my family to be born in the US. And like many children from immigrant families, um, you know, we're taught study hard, go to school, get good grades, go to good college, get that good job. So I followed this very prescribed path. And along the way, I fell in love with medicine. So that's what I did. I went through medical school and fell in love with, you know, eye and ophthalmology and eye surgeries and just giving the gift of sight. But after I got out of that training, I started working. And then this is what really got me was I realized, okay, I'm making a pretty good money, but the one thing that I can never make back, the one non-renewable resource, my time, I could never get back. And this especially hit home. Like I already had this feeling, but this especially hit home when my daughter was born. Um, she's five now, but um, I remember she had 103 degree fever and had just gone back to work after maternity leave. She was probably three or four months old. And the nanny calls me and was like, can you come home? I'm not sure what to do. And I remember looking at my clinic schedule and I was like, I cannot, you know, because I can't just cancel on these patients, but I'll be home as soon as possible. And I just remember that feeling like I'm serving everyone, but the one thing that I want to do right now, which was to be with my daughter, to figure out what's going on, I couldn't do because I didn't have that time freedom. And that time I realized was more valuable than anything. And that's when I sought to see what I could do and discovered this thing called passive income. And through that, I discovered real estate. And that's when I was off to the races with real estate. I love that. So talk to me about your, so what you talk about is that passive income creates optionality and choices. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen my TEDx talk, but it's, it's all about the cho choice creates happiness, right? Choice gives you mm -hmm. time freedom. Cho choice gives you rela the relationships that you want. And so I love your perspective on that. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think money can't buy happiness, right? In right. and of itself, but it buys you that optionality as we're talking about, you know, because once you take off that financial burden off of you, you're a little bit freer to say, okay, now I don't need to trade my time to earn this paycheck, to pay the bills, to pay the mortgage. What do I do with that time? And sometimes it just means I want to work more. I want to see That's more right. patients. I want to do more surgeries. But the freedom of saying it's my choice to do that is different than saying I have to do it. And I think that's the key distinction that I want your audience to know is it's different when you're doing something, but then you feel like you have to do it mm -hmm. versus, hey, I'm choosing to do it. You, it might be the same thing. For instance, like, you know, I could do 20 cataract cases, but it's one thing to say I have to do it because I have to earn this amount of money to cover this expenses versus hey, I choose to do it because I love it. I want to help these patients. Right. It just brings a completely different viewpoint and it's so freeing. Yeah, I think it also really um, helps to shift the, your identity. So I've got a similar story. My husband and I were trying to get pregnant. We were going through the fertility thing and I had had 11 miscarriages and we were on our 12th mm -hmm. pregnancy. And um, I remember one morning I went to my doctor to do my ultrasound and we lost the heartbeat that morning. Mm -hmm. And um, just, I remember just bawling in the, you know, in the, the little white room that I was sitting there, the doctor left to give me a moment and I just cried and cried and cried and then called my husband and I said, baby, we lost the heartbeat. I need you. Yeah. And he says, it's, it was in the morning, it was about 11 o'clock. And he said, sweetheart, I've got meetings all day. I'll be home at four o'clock. And I think, and he wanted to be there with me. And of course I knew that it wasn't his fault, but I think for him, he also realized, you know what? I want to be able to be a yes. And that my identity as a software programmer is not as important as my identity as husband to Monica. Um, and so it was an interesting shift from 
professional, this is how I identify myself and this is my value to, I want to be at choice for this. I want to be a programmer because it's fun. And so that's when he really got involved. He's yeah. still not hugely involved in my business, but really got his buy-in on, we need to create enough passive income mm -hmm. so that if you decide that you don't want to be a programmer anymore, or you don't want to be tied up to a job that now you can do that. So then when you're doing it, it's because you love it, because you're passionate about it, not because you have to. So it's really this idea of creating the passive income to become job optional, not necessarily retire. I say retire and all of my stuff because it's an easier way to say it sounds better than job optional. But really what we're going for is being able to create the bliss in your life that you're searching for. And that may be continuing to work, right? And I think for a lot of us, it's going to involve some sort of work, right? For us, whether it be, hey, I want to stay home more with my kids. I mean, I think being a mom is a lot of work. I have two young children. So that in itself is work. But you, you get to choose, as you said, what your identity, what title you want to choose. And it could be fluid. Mm -hmm. But then it becomes your choice instead of saying, I have to be changed to this nine to five at this desk because my employer told me I have to. That's and right. I have to get that every two week paycheck. And so That's I right. have to, I have to be this identity, you know, from Monday to Friday, from nine to five. Mm -hmm. But then what if you have those options with passive income to say, well, Monday and Tuesday, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a surgeon, but you know, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I want to be a mom or I want to be a real estate investor or mm -hmm. whatever you want to do. Right. Um, it just gives you a lot more choices. And I think the, just the, the flexibility of having options is what frees the mind. Because I think when people get stuck um, and feeling like they're quote unquote trap is when they don't have options. But if mm -hmm. you have 10 options, even whatever problem you're solving, it doesn't seem like a problem anymore, you know? And then it's very freeing. Yeah. It, or it feels, it may feel like a challenge, but you, you, you have more confidence. You have more emotional and mental and creative confidence that you can get through it, you know, get to the other side of it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you think anybody can invest in real estate? I really do. Uh -huh. <laughs> I really do. So tell me about um, that. I, I knew nothing about real estate other than buying our primary home. Um, and there's so much out there right now, so much education. Maybe it was different 20 years ago. I don't know. I, I didn't look way back, but I'm sure if there's a will, there's a way. But especially in this day and age, there's podcasts, there's free webinars, there's a bunch of events that you could go to. So it's just a matter of getting educated, but also getting your mindset right. Because a lot of the roadblock to people starting in real estate is in their minds and the mind games that they play themselves with. You know, as Tony Robbins likes to say, 80% of success is psychology mm -hmm. or mindset and only 20% is strategy because if it were all strategy, then, you know, all of us would, you know, be, uh, have six packs, you know, yeah, <laughs> and all, all the librarians would be billionaires, right. Um, with all the books that they, they consume. So it's not just the knowledge it's also knowledge with your mindset and then with action that, yeah. you know, you could really make it happen. Yeah. I've been calling mindset the ultimate strategy. Absolutely. Right. It is a strategy in and of itself to get that under control. Right. Yeah. And, and a lot of the mindset, you know, as we were talking um, before, it's just the identity you choose for yourself mm -hmm. and the stories that we choose ourselves. Because, you know, as women, how many stories do we tell ourselves that are not necessarily true or that mm -hmm. we think is true? And then we found so much evidence to reinforce it, to say That's it's right. true when it's really not. Right. Right. I always tell people, you know, everything that's going on in our lives, we've made up anyways. We make up the story, right? The circumstance happens and three different people will see it diff three different ways. So yeah. you've made up your story about that <laughs> circumstance. Why not make up stories that support you and make you and uplift you and give you those rose colored glasses that will make life ha easier and more blissful rather than making up the stories about um, strife and difficulty and challenges and exhaustion and all of those things, right? Absolutely. Uh, the circumstance is just the fact of the circumstance. It's mm -hmm. how we view, as you, as you said, through our colored lens or no color lens, that that's how it shapes our perception and our thoughts of it. And then our thoughts ultimately sh shape our actions, which lead to our results. So 
that's why it all starts with mindset, you know, is circumstance, but then the thoughts we put on it, which ultimately drive our action and then our results. So yeah. Yeah, it's, it's all in what story you want to tell ourselves, right? Like when we're little girls, some of us tell ourselves these fairy tales. Why can't we, why can't we dream like that anymore? We can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Talk to me a little bit about the difference between um, active real estate investing as opposed to passive real estate investing, because you've definitely chose passive, right? So talk to me a little bit about how you see those differences. I think it's a spectrum of active versus passive. I think oftentimes we make this clear divide, but it's not necessarily so, right? And I think um, it just depends on your circumstance and what you want, what your goal of investing is. So I've done both. I started off active, like many people do that we think of real estate investing, which is to go buy um, a single family or a duplex and then go rent it out, which is exactly what I did because it's what I knew and what I was comfortable with, because with comfort gives certainty, right? And it makes you take action. So I'm so glad I did that. Um, but I st as I started building up my portfolio, um, I first self-managed my first one and quickly realized um, it was not worth my time. You know, my time was better spent with my children, um, you know, taking care of my patients. So I quickly had it handed off to a property manager. But even with a property manager, the decisions always float up to the top. It's so true. I get the calls about it. Um, and then the other thing about active is you're the one who has to go source the property, go find it, put the offer and you might not win it. Right. So it does take time just to find the property and get it under contract and all that. And then even for property manager, it still requires some of your time management. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I was at the park with my daughter and I get this call from the property manager and they're like, well, all the water has backed up into both bathrooms into this property. And I was like, okay, it's like, don't worry. I'll get it all taken care of. But of course you kind of worry, right? You mm -hmm. can't just not worry. The sewer had backed up. So instead of spending that afternoon with my daughter, I was like spent on the phone texting and calling. So that's an example of what I found wasn't quite fitting the lifestyle that I wanted at this time. And that's when I discovered passive investing. So passive investing um, with syndications. So for those of us who don't know what syndications are, it's just basically a group investment. So instead of you taking your $100,000 and buying a single family home, for instance, you could take that $100,000 and pull it with a group of people to buy, say, a $10 million apartment building. So no one person can probably just have that huge down payment or that money to buy that apartment. But as a group, you can do that. And um, I've shifted to the strategy for several reasons. One is my time. As I said, you know, um, even if I had the time, um, I didn't necessarily want to spend it, you know, um, working in with a real estate business and doing all the properties that I want to spend time with my daughter and being the best surgeon that I can and, and honing that craft. And the second was like, I could really leverage a professional team um, who do this full time and leverage their network, their time, their expertise. And then the third thing that um, I saw was just really, I'm able to diversify because when I was buying my own active properties, you know, I like to see and feel and touch it. So I invested in my backyard here in Atlanta. So I was pretty confined, you know, in, in terms of market. But now I get an invest in the South, the Southeast and the Midwest. Um, I could also diversify in terms of I do mostly multifamily, but I invested in hotels and, you know, other commercial properties. And then you get to kind of spread your money across different sponsors as well, because you could put 50K here, 100K here and really spread it across. So you're, you're mitigating your risk across markets and then also across sponsors. And then one more thing that I really like is that you have limited liability. So when you own your own properties, even if you put in an LLC, you're personally liable. Eventually the buck stops with you. Um, with being a limited partner in syndications, you're basically limited to the amount that you invest in, no matter what happens for the most part. Mm -hmm. And so if someone falls on the sidewalk and sues, the most they could ever get is the amount that you invested in, you know? Um, so I really like those aspects. And right now, because I have young children and I'm busy with my career, I found that passive investing um, has been a great vehicle for me. How did you actually get into 
um, into investing in syndications. And, and three, let me give you some perspective, Nancy, on why I'm asking that question. So for my, so I'm in a lot of syndications for exactly the same reasons, different markets and different class yeah. class types, right? So I have a mobile home, I'm invested in storage, mobile home parks, yeah. uh, multi-unit, um, even some big luxury uh, single families, right? So, mm-hmm. so I, I, I'm in some really cool projects and I have my own projects also, right? Awesome. Um, but I get so many of these that come across my desk now as a podcast host. I mean, I'm people know me now, right? Because I'm public about that I'm interested in this. And so I get so many of these that come across mm-hmm. my desk. So for me, I know how I got started. I these started, I started having guests like you on my show, right? Um, but how did you get started? What turned you on to that? Yeah, how I heard this term syndication, I had never heard of it, even though I had been, you know, buying single family and duplexes was one of my husband's colleagues, my husband's also a physician. So one of his colleagues had owned uh, quite a bit of a portfolio here. And all of a sudden, when we got with him one day, just to catch up, he's like, Hey, I sold off all my whole portfolio. I'm just investing in these syndications. Mm-hmm. Like what, what, what is this? So I started, we started digging and I started really digging and found out what it was. And at first I thought, you know, this is like a scam. Like it, it sounds like a Ponzi scheme, but as I got further into it and got educated, right. I think that's the key is the more education you get, the more confidence you feel. I'm like, I think this is legitimate. You know, I, you know, I, I hear people doing it. I've seen it work for other people. They have these structures in place. So, you know, the, the key thing is really to vetting the sponsor and vetting the deal. I mean, mm-hmm. I think that's key. Number one is sponsor. Number two, I would say is market. And then number three is the actual deal. Okay. Um, so that's what we did. Um, I started interviewing different sponsors who were doing it um, and really getting comfortable and kind of watching on the sidelines before I jumped in um, just to make sure that we were right fit, that they were conducting themselves, characterized, characterized in a way that I, someone I want to partner with. But it is scary because you're handing over control to someone else Versus if you bought your own property, you know, you get to choose when you refinance, when you, what colors you paint the walls, et cetera. Like this is like handing over $50,000, $100,000 to someone is saying, I trust you to be a good steward of this money mm-hmm. that you're going to protect it and grow it. So it is scary when you first wire that money to someone you might, you know, have just met o- online. So, so absolutely. But the, I think the first key is just to get educated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As you were saying that, um, something came to me is that it's a little bit, not quite, but it's a little bit like investing in stock, right? Because when you're, when you invest in the stock market into a company, you're basically turning over this money to a company where they make all of the decisions. You have very little stay unless you're a major stockholder, right? And, um, and they're kind of managing the whole thing, right? And I feel like in syndications, it's a little bit, we have a lot more control over who we invest with. We have a lot more information about who's running the project um, and that sort of thing. But it is a little bit of that same feeling of someone else has control over this project that I'm now investing in, right? Would you say that that's true? I, I would agree and disagree with that. So I okay. would agree in the sense that, yes, you are handing over your money to someone. So it feels like you don't have control anymore. Mm-hmm. But something that I like about syndication that's different from stock market is that you actually know who's controlling it. In the stock market, you're kind of like, well, let me click this button and some big corporation is doing it, mm-hmm. um, which brings me to the point of the difference between syndications and REITs. Because sometimes, you know, when I talk to um, other women or, or physicians or investors, like, yeah, I don't need to diversify in real estate. I own some some REITs or some stocks in real estate. And those are two different things because owning a REIT is like buying stock or a share in a company that invest in real estate, but you actually don't own the real estate like you do when you invest in a syndication, Mm -hmm. which is like you own a fraction of a piece of real estate. So you still get all the depreciation, the tax benefits, the cash flow versus when you invest in a REIT is really like investing, say in Apple or Facebook, you, you get a share in that stock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Thank you. Um, and you know what, these are great investments. REITs are great investments. 
if you want to be completely hands off, right? Mm -hmm. um, and REITs, they have different kinds of REITs. Like you can go into doing malls. You can go, they like, you could do all of it, right? You could do them, the mobile homes. They've got all these different REITs or whatever, or full spectrum, right? Um, but that's more, to me, that's a little bit more like a mutual fund, right? With Absolutely. a manager. It's not as much as like direct real estate investment. So good distinction. Thank you for that. Um, talk to me a little bit about, investing for impact. I know this is a big piece of who you are in the world. Um, so I'd love to hear kind of how you do this and, and why this is so important to you. Yeah. So I, I think at the core of it, especially for us women, when we invest is, it's great to get the returns, but I think especially for women, we're so purpose-driven, we're so community-driven um, that a lot of the women investors that I talk to really resonate with the fact that they want to, do something bigger for the world, for mm -hmm. their community, for their families. And if you think about it, that's what money's for. It, it's not just to collect this pile of cash. It's really what can you do with it? Um, and I think if you can make a positive impact for yourself, for your family, for your community, for the world, it's just so much better. And for me, um, one of my really passion projects that's just preventable blindness, I was turned on to ophthalmology, the field of eyes. Um, when I was a medical student and medical student, and I witnessed the miracle of cataract surgery for the first time when this completely blind patient was hunched over, walked in with someone assisting him and with a 10 minute surgery, walked out jumping for joy and able to independently stand up and walk away. And it just changed his life. Um, but what your audience may not know is that 80% of the world's blindness is preventable with something as simple as a pair of glasses or a five or 10 minute, $25 cataract surgery. And I just think that's unacceptable. So part of my mission with real estate investing and the profits I earn is going towards this cause, because I, I really think it's, um, it's a tragedy and an injustice for people to live like this, who mm. are blind and don't necessarily have to be. Yeah. And so I, you know, would challenge your audience. There's something that you want to make an impact off because I think we're all purpose driven. We all want to grow and contribute in some way is find what you're passionate about and then see how your returns and your investments from real estate or whatever you're investing in can help feel that, that mission of yours. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm so passionate about, because I think impact investing, you, you can invest not just for great returns, but also making a positive social impact on whatever you decide to make an impact on. Yeah. How does that translate for you? So does that mean that you have extra time to actually do the surgeries? Um, do you contribute to other organizations that do the surgeries? Kind of how do you utilize the money that you make from real estate to, to make that possible for yourself? Absolutely. I would love to travel more to be able to actually lend my skills to this. And I've done so in the past um, with COVID obviously is less easier. And with two young kids, it's harder to travel. But as I get older, it's definitely a priority of mine to actually physically go and perform these cataract surgeries. Um, but currently I partner, um, I partner with different organizations before, but the one that I partner with, with my company, my real estate company, Clear Vision Investing is a nonprofit called GiveSite Global. And um, why I really love their mission is, yes, they're on this mission to cure preventable blindness, but they're doing it very entrepreneurially. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, the, it's the thought of, you know, don't just give a man a fish, but teach them how to fish. So instead of saying, hey, we're just going to send a group of surgeons in there from the US, from Canada for two weeks and to do a bunch of cataract surgery, which is the traditional model, right, of, quote, curing preventable blindness, they're instead um, funding these vision centers where the people in the village or the community are actually going out to screen their own people to see who needs surgery. And in turn, they're building surgery centers within the hospital and bringing in people, surgeons from the US or Europe to teach people within that community, the doctors within that community, or you know, they have, might have to travel further to actually learn to do these surgeries. So it, it, be, it becomes a self-sustaining cycle where when you donate once, it kind of hopefully continues the cycle where you don't have to keep donating the money or like bringing in surgeons every two weeks, every two months, you know? So it's setting that foundation for them, letting them run it as a business. 
I love that. The sort of self-sustaining contribution. So um, I've got a little story like that too. Um, my ladies know that um, I'm, I have, since I was very, very young, a 16 year old woman, been contributing to the education of women in India because of a traumatic experience that I had when mm. I was living there. Um, and so then as I um, became a little bit older, the temple that I'm affiliated with opened up a school in India to educate the community. So not just girls, girls mm. got education, but to educate the boys also that equality is a good thing, right? So to elevate yeah. the entire community so that the women get educated and can have a better life. Everybody has a better life, right? If it, as each of us is uplifted. So I became very involved with that school and have made multiple thousands of dollars of contribution to that school mm. over the years. And my ladies have heard about this. Um, but what's been very, very interesting lately is I had a conversation, I was having lunch with my Swami um, and he was saying that the school is now completely self-sustaining. So they mm. built, um, they built a water line that they can then utilize and they also sell some water now um, and then that water line also goes to their orchard of coconut trees so mm -hmm. they then sell coconut milk coconut water coconuts all this stuff because it's a very big product in india to surrounding communities so now through the the building of and they have some cows so they can they have milk so they've got all this stuff that they they have their farm so now the school is self-sustaining as far as its food and nutrition and all of that stuff they also can sell some of this so that, that they can continue to pay the teachers and stuff like that. Now, I still donate because I want them to expand, expand yeah. further, which is what their goal is. But the students that are in the school right now, all 1,000 of them, are guaranteeing an education up through high school, basically from, I think it's from uh, kindergarten through high school. So it's a full wow. 12 grades. Once they're in, they're guaranteed that education because they're self-sustaining. So for me, I also really appreciate it. And it was part of the goal from 20 years ago, right? When we first started this is that, yes, we have to build and we need to get donations and all of those things. Mm -hmm. And part of the plan is to make it self-sustaining so that these children are guaranteed the education, the communities are guaranteed this uplifting presence mm -hmm right an opportunity in their communities and for it to be self-sustaining so that we're not constantly trying to get more money and doing the fundraising thing right so it's to me that's sort of the new path of mm -hmm. contribution would you agree with me on that i absolutely agree um when when is self-sustaining like that or requiring very minimal continuous donations it not only, you know, helps the donors or nonprofits that are keep having to chase donor money, right? But mm -hmm. it also helps the communities or the countries that you're trying to help because, as you said, it uplifts them. Because mm -hmm. when you give someone the power to change their situation, um, give them the power to earn some money and give them the power of entrepreneurship, their lives can change because then mm -hmm. they realize they have the power within to change their situation. Right. So I think that's so powerful, not just from a monetary contribution standpoint, but also from the point of view of the people that we're actually trying to help. Yeah. I had yeah. never thought of that, Nancy, that other piece of like, oh, that this is even possible. Like the mindset shift that happens, yeah. right. Is, is, um, wow, that's amazing. You just changed my paradigm right there. Thank you for that. <laughs> Oh, you're welcome. Well, I'll give you a classic example is there's actually um, a gender gap with blindness. Um, so 55 or a little over 55% of people who are blind around the world are actually female and girls. So now that we've given them this opportunity to go around screening people for vision, they have economic opportunities that they other otherwise wouldn't be able to have. So after they get their surgeries and their care of their blindness and able to see, they're actually able to contribute to the very organization and mission of what helped them with their vision. So mm -hmm. it's like a self-sustaining cycle where the people that you help are now able to help others in their community. 
so yeah, I, I think it's, it's wonderful if we could find some self-sustained solution for all problems around the world. Wow. I just love that. I love that. There was, um, and I've never said this on air and I'm not sure exactly how to articulate this. Um, and I don't want it to come out wrong. So ladies just bear with me for a minute, but, um, I'm very much into Abraham Hicks. Do you know anything about this law of attraction? Um, this, she kind of started this trend. Esther Hicks started this trend, Esther and Jerry, it's a long story, but I'm very much into sort of the law of attraction that what we put out there is what we, we get in return. So when I talk about having a blissful life, part of that blissful life is that I know I'm an, um, an attractive magnet for bliss to come towards me, right? Because that's the energy that I send out consistently. It's my biggest mission in my own life. And that works financially and health wise and all of those things. What you put out is attractive. So, and we all kind of know that, um, but there's this, what we call the law of attraction. So anyway, so I'm really into Esther Hicks and Abraham Hicks. And I was on a cruise once with them and um, someone came to the dais and said, not the dais, but the chair, you know, the hot seat. Um, you can tell I'm Indian. They came to the dais. And- <laughs> Right. <laughs> so funny. But anyway, so she they come to the hot seat and they said she said, I wanted to make all of this money so that she can contribute, she can contribute to to um, causes. And what Esther immediately said, and she supposedly channels and I believe that she does, but whatever for whatever she channeled that she channels all of her answers. And the answer that came back is that so that you can enable people's inability to take care of themselves. Mm-hmm. Wow. And I was, I was actually really offended by that because I am so big into contribution and I feel yeah. like there are so many people that are so much less fortunate than me. I want to help. I'm so blessed with what I'm capable, what I'm able to do. Right. And so I, I, it's a big piece of who I am and how I define myself. And so I was really offended. But then as we have this conversation today, Nancy, about contribution can have a different face. It's not necessarily giving to people and enabling them to continue to need, Mm -hmm. right? But it can be enabling people to grow and be uplifted and to then turn around and contribute in the way that they were contributed to, right? Absolutely. That's beautifully said. Yeah. I hope that, so that was such a beautiful paradigm shift for me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. No, that's beautiful. You, you put it perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. This has been such a lovely conversation. We've got more. Um, Nancy wants to talk about harmony and ing- integration, right? As women, we play so many roles with her. It's physician, mother, wife, surgeon, right? Investor, entrepreneur, philanth- philanthropist, right? There's so many roles that she plays and there's so many roles that each of us plays in our life. Daughter, grandchild, sister, right? There's so many of these, friend. Um, and we've had other ladies come on the show and talk about sort of that balance, but we haven't had, I think that each time we have a lady talk about that, we pick up new nuggets yeah. because each of us are perceiving our lives in different ways and we bring a different skill set into creating that harmony. So I feel like we're due for that conversation again. So I asked Nancy if she'd be happy to share with that with us in extra. And she said yes. So I'm so excited. So we're going to be talking about that in extra. Um, so stay tuned, ladies. But Nancy, can you tell people, I know you've got a free gift for my ladies. So could you share about that? Yes. Um, I have a free due diligence checklist for the ladies who are interested in real estate syndications. So some of you might be interested in buying your own rentals for, but, but for those of you who are like, I never want to be a landlord. I don't want to fix toilets, deal with tenants. A great way is to passively invest. Like we briefly touch upon in this episode through syndications. But one of the things that stop a lot of people is that they don't know where to start or what questions to ask, or how do they know that the sponsors, whoever they handing the money to is not going to take it and run it away and never to be seen again. Mm -hmm. So I put together this checklist because it has, these questions have helped me analyze the deals that I've been looking at when I was first started. So you could go to my website at clearvisioninvesting.com. Um, under learn, there'll be a due diligence checklist and it's free. So just download it, see if you could get any value from it. And I'd love to um, hop on a call to chat if you wanted to and walk you through it. 
Oh, nice. And so that's all at clearvisioninvesting.com, right? Correct. That's how they can reach you and all of that too. Yes. Perfect. Thank you for that. That was very generous. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Are you ready for our three rapid fire questions? I'm ready. Let's go. Okay. So Nancy, tell us one super tip getting started investing in real estate. Education, education, education. The more you get educated, the more confident you'll be and the more you'll be ready to take action. Um, That's the question I get asked quite often by a lot of ladies, a lot of women physicians, how do I get started? And I said, start with your education. That's the one thing that no one can take away from you. And once you're armed with that power, you're, you, you're ready, you know, you're ready. So armed with education and then getting your mindset right. And then taking action, you'll get the results that you want. So start with your education. I love that. And then what's one strategy on being successful as a real estate investor? I think it's just learning to pivot. Um, And I take this from my um, medical and surgical career because there's been so many times I've had to pivot, right? Whether it be this medication is not working, I have to pivot to another medication, or I'm in the middle of eye surgery and something is wrong. I have to pivot to get through the surgery. And I've taken those skills to apply to real estate because as we know, as real estate investors, nothing is as planned, no matter how much you underwrite it, no matter how much the pro forma looks great, something is always bound to go wrong or not take the turn that you didn't expect it to. So just learning to recognize the situation as it is, as we talked about in this episode, and then what are the options? You know, what do you do from here? So I think just having that flexibility and knowing how to pivot will take you a long way. Mm. Oh, that's so good. Yes. And it's been so real over the last couple of years, right? With so much changing so fast. Absolutely. If you just think about from COVID to now, right? During COVID, it was like, oh my goodness, like all these prices are blowing up, but the interest rates were super low. And mm-hmm. then now as interest rates are rising, people are kind of shooting themselves in the foot to say, I should have locked in at the low interest rate because I still would have earned a better return than yes, the prices are you know, stabilizing or kind of falling, depending on the market you are, but now the interest rates are high and, you know, some properties don't even cash flow anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's just learning to pivot according to what the current conditions are. Yeah. I love that. And then Nancy, what would you say is one daily practice that you do that contributes to your personal success? The one thing is that I have a very, um, set morning routine and part of that includes exercise. So I exercise almost every day is very rare that I miss it unless I'm traveling or something, because I feel that if you get your body right in the right state, it really puts your mind in the right state. And then you're ready. You just feel like you're ready to take the world, you know, Mm -hmm. after that. Mm -hmm. So I, I love to get my body like just running and moving, um, first thing in the morning so that, I feel like nothing can derail me. So do that before you pick up your phone, um, answer to emails. It's just set that time for yourself. It might not be exercise for some people, it might be something else. But before you pick up that phone to check Instagram or Facebook, leave that alone and just really focus on you for the first 30 minutes or so of the morning. And then and then you could react to everything else, you know, yeah. because we're so used to just reacting throughout the day that we're not proactive about what are, what are our intentions? How do I want to act? How do I want to react to various situations throughout the day? Right. I always say that my little smartphone is this little device of other people's agendas. You know, even a game is another person's agenda, right? They've got in-app purchases, right? (laughs) So every little thing, this little device has everybody else's intentions and everybody else's agendas. You do. And it's hard, right? It's totally hard. I mean, literally I have my phone right next to me as we're speaking, Yes. right? It it attaches to us, but I think just, just, just saying, I'm not going to touch it for this amount of time in the morning in particular is So it just sets your day so well, because then you're really like, this is my agenda for this time and for this day. Right. It really sets you, set you, sets you straight on the right road going, (laughs) moving forward. I love that. Thank you for that. This has been such a a great show. Thank you for all that you've offered my ladies, Nancy. Thank you for having me. I'm glad. And hopefully people took something away from it. And I'm, I always learn from these conversations and from people I meet. So we are, we're all better together, you know, a rising tide lifts all boat. I really believe in that saying, and, um, we just lift each other up. 
Yeah, thank you so much. And ladies, we've got more, so stay tuned. So Nancy's going to be sharing how to like integrate and harmonize all of those roles that we play in our lives. It's so important to our bliss. So I'm really excited that she's going to be sharing her perspective on that in Extra. So if you are subscribed to Extra, stay tuned. If you are not, you can get subscribed by going to Real Estate Investing for Women Extra. Dot com. For those of you that are leaving uh, Nancy and I now, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us for this portion of the show. I so appreciate you and I look forward to seeing you next time. And until then, remember, goals without action are just dreams. So get out there, take action and create the life your heart deeply desires. I'll see you soon. Bye. I hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to find out more about how to become a blissful millionaire, go to blissfulinvestor.com. See you next time.